talk about that first. My outline is here. I'd like to first discuss what this is. This may not be an area that's familiar to everyone, so just a few words about this. I, I, as an analytical chemist, my area of specialization is spectroscopic techniques, and one of the techniques we love to use for our studies is fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. I'd like to use that and use that as a, to highlight the analysis of small molecule adsorption at the surface at some of the abrasive particles that are used in uh, nat and alpha alumina and silica nanoabrasives that are used in this CMP application. Then add a second technique, in this case, attenuated total internal reflectance, FTIR, and this actually helps us address specific molecular interactions that occur in those adsorption events on uh, abrasive, nanoabrasive particles when they are cast into thin films. And I'll bring up, I'll use two examples here. First, the adsorption of picolinic acid on ceria and zirconia nanoparticle films. And then the real important area, the, the, the adsorption behavior of, of small molecules on silica. And I'll, I'll get to why silica is so important in this area in just a moment. But to sort of begin at the beginning here, this is just a simple depiction of what the chemical mechanical planarization technique involves. It's basically a, a method that allows us to, um, there's no pointer here, but I'll try. Maybe you can see that. This is a, a, a typical representation of a chemical mechanical planarization apparatus. A wafer, a silicon wafer, is head, held in place on a rotating head, which is being pressed mechanically with the given down force against a basically a, a polymeric pad, usually made of some sort of polyurethane material, which is also being rotated and onto that pad is being dripped it, or, or is a slurry, an abrasive slurry that is a mixture basically of particles, again, typically nano-sized particles these days, so that wasn't always the case, and some sort of chemical additive, some sort of chemical solution that provides a, um, uh, a mixture and provides chemical action and the abrasive particles provide the mechanical action that produces polishing or planarization to atomic flatness, hence the name chemical mechanical planarization. So what's going on here is sort of a simultaneous uh, brushing away of material as it is abraded off the surface of the wafer uh, after chemical reaction by the additives and the abrasive particle adds that mechanical uh, abrasion to the surface to produce an atomically flat surface. So down here is just a, rel a simple example, of a cartoon of a wafered pattern, pattern wafer that has an overburden or, a, or an extra layer of extra material on top. The chemical mechanical planarization process abrades and chemically etches away this upper layer to produce an atomically flat surface. So yet another layer of circuitry can be deposited in another layer. All right, so this, this technology is not new. It's been around for a very long time, and it had been thought that eventually this, this technology would be replaced you know, at some point in, in the future, but it, it has not been. This particular technique has been around for at least 20 years, and from what we can tell, the, chem the industries that produce silicon, that chips, for example, the Intels and the Samsungs of the world, are, are continue to produce, use this particular technology, hence they need a continuous source of slurries that are make these brace of chemical mixtures, but the specifications of the requirements of these slurries have changed significantly as the feature size of silicon of these chips has changed. So as the line width, for example, has gotten smaller and smaller, the, the customization of the slurry has gotten to be increasingly important component here. I'd like to sort of dwell on that just a little bit to talk to you about that the interactions between the abrasive particle and the chemistry that's inside the particle is actually quite important. And what we see here is in this picture is just a depiction of basically a wafer that is in contact with an abrasive slurry and then there's a, some sort of polishing pad down here on the bottom. And again, the abrasive is pushed or down against the wafer, which produces a, a polishing action. But in the, uh, the added chem the chemical additives added here have the opportunity to absorb at a number of surfaces. 
They can adsorb at the surface of the wafer. They can adsorb at the surface of, of the wafer here. They can adsorb at the surface of the pad. They can also adsorb at the surface of the abrasive particles. So basically there's all these surfaces that are of interest where the chemistry can go. Now in the case of the abrasive, the abrasive is really the kind of advanced material here because what has happened as again, the feature size that has been created on these wafers gets smaller and smaller to be consistent with Moore's law. What's happened is we, the, the particle sizes that are being used for these abrasive particles have become smaller and smaller to prevent uh, gouging and defect creation on, on, on these silicon wafers patterns, this, this, this circuitry. But the chemistry that's present in solution to help that process, this CMP process, is in constant equilibrium, both attaching itself to the abrasive particle and going back into solution. There is some sort of equilibrium process here. And the idea is, as, at the, as, the, as the type of wafers where, that are being produced get more and more sophisticated with narrow feature size, there's gonna be increasing need to somehow functionalize these abrasive particles to basically make them more uh, useful in the polishing of extremely small features on the wafer to do more specific type of polishing interactions. The thing, of course, to remember is this is an equilibrium situation that we can define an equilibrium constant. So analytical techniques that give us some knowledge of the equilibrium constant that defines this type of interaction, this binding and releasing interaction of an abrasive, of an additive on the surface of an abrasive is uh, very, very important. Uh, we are not gonna concern ourselves so much with the, the adsorption of the additive molecule on the wafer surface and the pad surface, that's kind of fixed, but we have the opportunity here to change the chemistry of the abrasive particle quite significantly to change the nature of the, the, the planarization, the chemical mechanical planarization. Well, the first technique that we have used extensively to study this is fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, and I'm not, it's not a technique that's really, really well known. It's, it's widely used in the biological area to study the interactions of dye molecules and, and binding behaviors in, in proteins, for example, or protein-protein interactions. But it also plays an interesting role here in the study of materials. So basically this experiment is a, is a, a fluorescence labeling experiment where we conduct this fluorescence measurement in a inverted fluorescence microscope, which is, is has confocal focusing so when we have a, a, a confocal volume here produced by the microscope, it has a dimension of typically about one femtoliter. And if we have a solution into which this, this incident green laser is focused, produces fluore red fluorescence, which comes back down through the, the ob high objective, height and marker lecture objective detected by the avalanche photodiode, we will be able to see this particle as it moves through this focal volume if the, and measure, get, get a burst of fluorescent signals. And basically what we see is, is that if we keep the concentration low enough in this tiny, tiny focal volume, we can basically detect on average one fluorescent species at a time. If we have a dye molecule, we'll see the just dye molecules. If the dye molecule, for example, becomes associated with a larger species like an abrasive particle, we will see the diffusion of the abrasive particle through that focal volume. Because of the, the larger hydrodynamic size of this complex of the dye and the abrasive particle, the pattern of bursts of fluorescence will be, occur at a much slower rate. So if we study this rate dependence and, and calculate the autocorrelation function of these fluorescent bursts, what we'll get are basically intensity weighted fluores uh, uh, in fluorescence intensity autocorrelation functions where species that have a dye that are larger in size but non fluorescent but pick up the dye will suddenly become fluorescent and we'll see this curve, this autocorrelation curve, move to longer correlation times because of the slower motion of the bigger species. Okay, so that's the background here that we use. We like this technique very, very much. And it gives us a couple of interesting measurable quantities. So here I've picked, depicted again, a large species and a small species. That's the mathematical formulation of the autocorrelation function. 
is a 3D auto, uh, point spread function produced by the fluorescence microscope. A couple of variables we can measure. We can measure the translational diffusion constant for one thing very easily by measuring the experimental points that give us this autocorrelation function. We can also get from this function a number of fluorescent molecules that happen to be in that tiny focal volume. So we come away with two measurable parameters, a diffusion coefficient and a number, average number of fluorophores or fluorescent species in the focal volume. We can, of course, by assuming these are spherical, which generally these abrasive particles are, we can easily calculate the, the Stokes diameter of those particles by knowing the temperature and, and the viscosity of, 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 the, of the solution we are using. So we come away with two measurable quantities, particular measurement of diffusion or a Stokes diameter or and numbers of molecules and fluorescent species in the focal volume. So let's look at a couple of examples here. This, as we've used this technique widely for all the commonly used abrasives, nano abrasives in the CMP area. We have used them for uh, alumina, and here's a, a, a very clear example. This is called this green. This is called Oregon green. Oregon green autocorrelation function decays quickly because it's small in the presence of a tenth of a percent of alpha alumina, which is a common CMP abrasive, curve shifts to longer time, all right? And you can very clearly see if we do a fitting, a single exponential fitting, for example, on just the dye itself, we come away with an excellent fit with very, very low residuals, the difference between the experimental data points and the fitted curve. However, and, and just to say the diameter here is 1.2 nanometers, hydrodynamic diameter. If we take a look again at that, that data where we have the mixture of alpha alumina and the Oregon green dye, which we believe these points to it, that data set is not well fit at all by a single component fit. This clearly indicates there's more than one component. There's a down component and a free component. The, the, the residuals plot show that clearly. We don't have random residuals. We have a, some ed, a feature here that is unaccounted for by the, the fitting. It, and the mean diameter here is clearly bigger than that of the free dye. The free dye was 1.2 nanometers, now we're at 1.9. If we change the way we do the analysis and we do a, um, this type of fitting here, what we see is a two component fit gives us a much better fitting of the data. All right, and we know now that, that, that in fact, if we do the analysis, only 8% of the organ green is bound. Most of it's free and the particle size is about 36 nanometers, which is in good agreement with the specification of 39 nanometers. The area that we've really, really wanted to investigate more fully and have been for many years is the adsorption to silica. Silica is a big deal because most of the abrasive particles used in this industry are silica. So again, we can see the same sort of pattern of the shift to longer decay times, we can do even more sophisticated fits with models that represent continuous distributions. And you can see the fitting of this experimental data with this method of maximum entropy type of analysis gives us a size about 70 nanometers. If we do this study as a function of concentration of both the particles and the Oregon green, we can easily get the Langmuir adsorption isotherm which is actually a very, very low number, the Langmuir constant, indicating that the interaction between the dye and the particles is a very, very um, uh, nonspecific one. It's a, it's, it's a weak binding interaction. Well, this is all great and good, but we need another technique. We wanted another technique to really understand what was happening at the surface of these particles when they come in contact with small molecules that could bind to their surface. So the technique we used is again an established technique where we're doing an attenuated total reflectance analysis and that analysis allows us to study the adsorption of, of molecules flowing into a flow cell in an FTIR instrument operated in attenuated total reflectance to see the adsorption on a, on a film. This is the typical kind of dimensions that this setup allows us to investigate basically doing the spectroscopy in this of roughly two micron film thickness. This is sort of a representative example of the kind of films that we can create. This one is just under 1.8 
microns. This happens to be Syria. Again, one of the materials that forms good films. We've successfully done this with Syria, alumina, silica, and zirconia. When we look at these type of studies, what one of the, our favorite type of molecules to study for this type of interact is picolinic acid. Picolinic acid is a, one of a family of pyridine, functionalized pyridine molecules with the carboxylate group, in this case, in the ortho position. And when we use picolinic acid to study these surfaces, and particularly serious surfaces, picolinic acid is a commonly used additive in CMP slurries. It's a rate enhancer. And it's most often used with Syria abrasive product, nano abrasives in the CMP application. And we can see right away from the behavior, because we have two exchangeable protons, that we have an intermediate form, which is zwitter ionic, and a base form, which is fully deprotonated. One of the things we needed to do here was to understand the IR spectra. So we did a very, fairly extensive study of investigating the spectroscopy, the vibrational spectroscopy of picolinic acid and related molecules. And we were pretty a easily able to assign the, the various func stretching re regions, stretching frequencies, for example, the carboxylate group, or the bending mode of CH bonds, or the ring motions, this new 14, new 19A, those are called the Wilson modes. They're binding the ring vibrations of this pyridyl group. Uh, this particular computational study was done by my colleague, uh, Wayne Bosma, and what it allowed us to do was to really understand the, the kind of behaviors that happen to picolinic acid when it's in contact with Syria film. So what we see here is again, the spectrum of the picolinic acid in the absence of the film, when the film is present at the same, using the picolinic acid at the same concentration, we see a net increase in the absorbance and the, the formation of new vibrations. These are vibrations due to the adsorbed molecules that are being picked out. And we can assign these to various species. So for example, this one here, this vibration, is principally a binding, a stretching mode of this carboxylate group, whereas this particular mode is a stretching mode of the ring, which principally involves the NH bond. So the, the, the takeaway here is that the binding interaction involves both the, the NH pyridyl nitrogen and the carboxylate group. If we look at this related molecule, this is isonicotinic acid, where the carboxylate group has been moved to the para position. So basically we've precluded the opportunity for these two groups to work in concept to produce adsorption as they would here. And what happens is we can't really see much going on in this with the ring modes, but once again, the carboxylate seems to be involved when we compare the spectrum of the film and the spectrum without the film. It, it's interesting to note that other molecules interact with, with the picolinic acid. For example, this one down here on the left, zirconia. Zirconia, again, where we have the, the no film spectrum and the spectrum in the presence of 40 millimolar picolinic acid, we very, very clearly see that once again, the carboxylate group is involved, but there's no really conclusive definitive evidence that the ring motions are being involved. So we don't think the pyridyl nitrogen is involved. So when we look at this, we can take a look and we can actually go in and calculate by changing the relative amounts of, of picolinic acid in contact with the film. We get a Langmuir constant that's on the order of about 3000. That's relatively low. What this suggests is that the interaction between the picolinic acid and the Syria film is not an inner sphere coordination of the cerium atoms, it's probably a outer sphere coordination through adsorbed water molecules. We could have both groups involved, both the carboxylate and the nitrogen function here, or we could have strictly just the carboxylate group. So it appears that when these two groups are together in close proximity, we will get this bidentate type of interaction. But in the case of zirconia, it, there appears to be the surface of zirconia. The chemi surface chemistry of the zirconia is different enough that the carboxylate interaction is heavily favored, so we don't see contribution from the ring groups. As I said, the major interest here is silica. Silica is the preferred of nanoabrasive in all CMP applications, and it really boils down to cost. Silicas are just simply much less expensive 
than these other abrasives, aluminas, zirconias, serious. And there's, there's enough known about, lots to known about silica surfaces that they can be easily functionalized and we can create all kinds of advanced hybrid materials with silica. Hence the companies that both make these slurries and use these slurries for CMP are very interested in the surface chemistry of silicas and in particular functionalized silicas. So I wanna finish up here by sharing with you just a thought here about silica. This is some work we did relatively recently where we were studying two different types of films. We managed to get very nice stable films of, of, really, of nanoparticulate silicas deposited on the IR substrate, the infrared substrate to do an ETR experiment. And they had roughly the same diameter of the particles. One of these films was co composed of non, of dehydroxylated abrasives and the other was composed of hydroxylated abrasives. You can very clearly see if we compare the spectrum of just trimethyl ammonium chloride, what we're looking at is the vibrational bands of the trimethyl ammonium ion. You can see there's two distinct bands here in the, in the absence of the film, there's no extra vibrations. But when the films are present, up pop these extra bands, all right, that indicate a binding interaction of the formation of adsorbed species of the, of the quaternary ammonium group. The quaternary ammonium group is a commonly used uh, additive in, the, in CMP abrasives. These vibrational modes are still under study, but what we really think these are, are is these are rocking modes of the methyl group that become active when the trimethyl ammonium ion, which is high symmetry, gets onto the surface of the silica and the symmetry breaks down. So now the surface adsorbed species has effectively a lower symmetry than the species in solution and vibrations that are not normally seen in the free tetramethyl ammonium group become active and it become detectable and become diagnostic of adsorbed species at that surface. We've done the the, the isotherm analysis, and it's a very weak isotherm. Okay, I think I'm out of time or just about out of time. I'd like to sort of finish up by acknowledging the fact, the support of my department at Bradley University. We have had continuous interest and support from two companies, Cabot Microelectronics, which is the supplier of the slurries, and Intel Corporation, which is the um, company that of course uses them and world leading company in the fabrication of, of electronic circuits. Is there 